Yes, the time is there. Uh, yesterday we kind um, we left one exercise behind in the first exercise set, so uh, uh, we will start today by by uh, carrying uh, that final exercise out. And then we will move back to the textbook and uh, uh, start looking at chapter. I think it should be. Uh, uh, yes, a message before we start. Um, forgetting using the English version but uh, I assume you you understand it anyway um, it says something here next week Wednesday the 24th which is uh, the coming Wednesday and uh, then we will look into exercise set 2 okay uh, spend time and resources on testing your understanding by doing these exercises it will pay off when the exam comes okay this is the normal procedure, isn't it? That's why we do these exercises to prepare for the coming exam. Okay, do we have any preliminary questions here today? Anything related to the exercises we went through yesterday? Is everything clear? Or do you want us to repeat something? Something was unclear? Is it Tuesday? That's very nice of you to say, because um, it's, on it's on Wednesday. It is on Wednesday, according to Arnold. Uh, but I think that we should be able to find this from here, shouldn't we? Ah, I'm constantly being. Wednesday and Friday, that was uh, what I thought as well. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's just check it, okay? It should be here in the information. Uh. So next week is week 39. It says Wednesday here, the 24th. Maybe the 24th isn't Wednesday. Maybe that's the problem. Let me check my calendar. <coughs> so what was your name again? Veronica. I didn't hear it. Veronica. Veronica? Yeah. Are you satisfied with this? Yeah. Okay. Did you have another plan? Just a typo. Uh, just a typo. Okay. Then we settled that one. Okay, let's return to this uh, exercise. The final one in the first exercise set. It is about uh, utility theory and now we're moving one step further than just looking at indifference curves because now we int also introduce a budget constraint, so kind of putting things together. And this is exercise 15. It says Jane receives utility from days spent traveling on vacation domestically 
at home then or in her own country and they spent traveling on vacation in a foreign country F so it's domestic vacation or uh, foreign vacation which is kind of the goods we look at in these two good economy and her utility function is given as 10 times D times F so it's a kind of reversion of a utility function we have seen before in addition, the price of a day spent traveling domestically is $100, uh, while the price of a day spent traveling in a foreign country is $400. And Jane's annual travel budget is $4,000. So it's kind of a huge amount of money. It seems then that uh, Jane is living in, uh, should we say, uh, perhaps not poor, but maybe not rich, as it's much more expensive on the travel side to travel in foreign countries than at home. On the other hand, of course, when you travel at home, you're kind of more informed, so you are maybe able, able to make it cheaper. So we, we really d can't say anything about that. But the point is, of course, that these two goods have different prices here, and that's something which is relevant. Then we should illustrate the indifference curve associated with the utility of 800, and the indifference curve associated with the utility of 1200. We were doing uh, these kind of stuff yesterday, so let us just go straight at it um, to find indifference curves this is of course A when it exercises I think we need a utility function in this case it is 10 times F times D and we just equate that utility function to the given utility levels in this case it's either 800 or 1200 and then we solve each of these e equations with respect to one of the variables and we choose kind of the variable we like if we think about plotting it if we put f on the vertical axis and d on the horizontal axis then we should solve this with respect to f okay so solving with respect to f gives for the first utility level 10 F D equals to 800 we just divide by 10 D here then we get F isolated on the left hand side so it's 800 divided by 10 D then isn't it and of course we can reduce this one to take one of the zeros away so it's 80 over D and of course we immediately see don't we that the structure is the same here so it's just to substitute 80 with 1200 divided by 10 isn't it that is 120 so we get this other indifference curve as f equals to 120 over d so that is the answer or at least the starting answer to uh, a in this exercise of course it says that we should illustrate this is perhaps not a perfect illustration so the idea then is perhaps to make some drawings here of these two indifference curves I thought perhaps we could do this in Excel maybe to see if we're able to do it I just got an SMS again and I was yeah okay has anybody upgraded to iOS 8 yeah. who said yeah you have I if it's slower uh, what kind of a phone do you have 5S? Okay, so is it slower? Is it faster? Just the same. Is it useful? Is it better than the previous version? So it's no point in upgrading them. Maybe some functions you haven't seen yet. Okay. <coughs> okay. Do you all have access to Excel, the software? somebody who don't if you don't have access of course you know perhaps know that there is a free alternative called OpenOffice which works exactly the same way 
and you can download it from internet for free. Okay, so if you lack the Excel software, you can find substitutes here which don't cost any money. Of course, many computers these days come with Excel pre-installed. So, so in in most situations, people have access to it. Of course, at the computers here, Excel is normally installed. Okay, so if you use any of the computers at this institution, Excel is present. Okay. <coughs> Let's see if we can do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we start by defining the variable. Okay, so now we want to just enter some values for these d here. Okay, in both situations. And if you look at it, we see if d is one, then we can start there and maybe moving up to 80. That seems sensible here, up to 120. So maybe we should make a range of numbers from, uh, let's say, one or maybe from 10. 20 up to 120, not to get too many. Okay, so if we start with a value of 10 here, then we can just uh, add a formula where we add 10 to that previous cell, a1 plus 10, that should produce 20, and then we just copy this. Remember, you need the small black, uh, what is this called? Cross hatch to make the copy work. So now it's going to 30, 40, and then we should up to 120, maybe something like that. And then we can just enter both of these indifference curves, this one as well as this one. So we need to take uh, the value in the A cell, in this case it's A1, and we should divide it, no, sorry. We need to take the first utility level, 80, and divide it by A1 here to get the first value there, and then we can just do the same. Copy it down there, and we do the same for this other indifference curve, was which was 120 over A1. Oh, I forgot something, didn't I? You must always put an equal sign here in that to make it work. Then we do this, and then we have both the first axis values as well as the function values here. So now it's just a matter of plotting this. And if we mark both three columns and insert uh, a scatter plot, always use that. Maybe we should pick some nice lines here. Then we see the two indifference curves. They kind of look like indifference curves. They are perhaps not very smooth. The reason for the kind of bumpy behavior here is that the resolution here is a bit small. So if you put more numbers in, you get it more smooth here. Of course, there's always the option of doing this manually. In that case, you'll have to construct this table, uh, perhaps using a calculator. For each number here, you have to calculate the, the corresponding functional value by using these formulas. And uh, finally, then, of course, you have to represent all these points into this kind of diagram. Looking, your first one here is 8, okay, A is 10, so A, A corresponds to this axis, so we have to pick 10 here, then we got the value of 8, so it must be the red one, which is the first one here, perhaps, uh, perhaps not, 10 is here, 8 is there, so it's the blue one, of course, is the first one, and the red one is the second one, because the utility is higher, sorry about that. Okay, maybe we should keep this one. We may uh, use it later in the exercise. So let's move back to, where is it? Is it here? Yes. That was A. Okay, any questions? No questions. Then we move to B. Graph, Jane's budget line on the same graph. Okay, so now we need to construct the budget line. Do we have necessary information to find the budget line here? Yeah, we do, don't we? Because we have the price on domestic vacationing, which is $100 per unit of vacation. And we have this other price, the price of foreign vacation, which is $400 per unit. It's per day, perhaps? Yeah, day is the unit here. So then it's straightforward to construct the budget line, isn't it?
new to be. Hello, Kelly. The budget line. The budget line, of course, is the total amount of money used as a function of the kind of good choices the consumer make. So if F now is the number of days, number, number of days on vacation foreign outside your own country and uh, D is a similar construct here where which is spent on vacation domestically <coughs> then we kind of have our model structure basically because the price of foreign vacation is 400 per day we have to multiply that with the number of days we spend on foreign traveling and then we have to add the amount we spend on domestic vacationing which is d 100 times d and that should equal the the total amount of money which we have available here which is four thousand dollars so this is the budget constraint okay In order to graph it, of course, in the same graph, we need to solve for the same variables. So in this case, case, it's obviously needed to solve it with respect to f. Okay. To graph it. Solve with respect to f again. Again. It's written like this. Then we have 400 F plus 100 D equals to 4,000. And we probably see immediately that we can, we can make this simpler, can't we? By just taking out these two zeros, these two zeros, and these two zeros, then the equation becomes simpler. It's 4 F plus D equal to 40, isn't it? This is the same equation as that one, just by dividing through by 100. And if we move D on that side and divide by 4, we should get F equal to 40 minus D over 4. Is that correct? Did you get this? Of course, we can write this slightly simpler as well, can't we? It would be 40 divided by 4, which is 10 minus d quarters, which is the same as 0 0.25d, isn't it? Is this correct? Or is it wrong? Can't you help me? So this then is the version of this budget constraint which is kind of needed to graph it, either manually or in some kind of computer system. Okay, then we can just enter this formula into our Excel sheet, can't we? And see where it what it leads to. Okay, maybe we should get rid of this one then. If we just do a cut here. Then we keep our numbers and then we need to add the budget constraint as well here, which is starts always with an equal sign and then we have to add 10 minus 0. Remember to use a comma when you enter numbers in Excel, at least in the Norwegian version. Comma 25 times A1 should be the first value of the budget constraint and then it's just simply a matter of just copying down here again marking everything because we want to have all three curves in the same diagram we insert a scatter again choose the smooth stuff and you see this is the result we get it was perhaps not very nice it would be nicer perhaps to cut these to around 60 we can see that now and then kind of blow it up okay 
Do you think we're able to do that? What did you put in the tree? Did I put in here? Yeah. I put this equation in, which I should do. But you see, this is really not a nice uh, graph. It's kind of too much over here, which doesn't provide relevant information. You would like to blow off this part, perhaps. <coughs> and then we will have to change this one maybe to just 60 or maybe 40 is enough actually I would suggest we pick 40 here so let's try to do that then and see what happens if we're able to do it okay uh, now we need a, a slightly better resolution here so let's put only add 5 here instead see if that runs nicely of course this then is a problem isn't it because here it's still plus 10 so I would like to get rid of this one let's see if I'm able to do that Ah, uh, I'm not that good in Excel, so let me just get rid of it manually. Okay, and then now I add five. Maybe I should add even less. Maybe I should add only two. Let's try to do that instead. And then I just copy this one down like this. Then it's thirty-two. So I need a little bit more than, huh? Maybe down to. 40. Okay. Now I've kind of made a better resolution here. You can see that. Of course, I'm lacking something here, but you see that the graph is kind of updating automatically here. So I've been able to pinpoint at least the area that's interesting. Of course, to, to make it sensible, I must keep on copying this one down here as well as this one down there as well as this one, oh sorry, this one down there. Now I have a full set. Of course this one is not correct now, is it? Because it's based on just a subset of this one. So I have to get rid of it. Even though it's updated, it only updates these part of the numbers as you can see here. Okay, these numbers are not there. I want them as well. Okay. So I then just cut this one out and make a new graph. Same procedure, scatter. Now, it seems nice, don't it? You kind of see what's happening now. You see that one of these indifference curves is kind of cutting through into our feasible space. This green line could, should, of course, perhaps been put up here. And uh, then it would be nicer, but it, it's kind of tricky because then we we can't put zero in because then we don't, don't get values for it. Then we have to do manual editing and kind of stuff. But uh, it's possible to make it even nicer than this without too much fuss. So we see now that one of the indifference curves is above the budget constraint. One is partly under it. And that tells us that the optimal solution here must be somewhere in between. Okay, So we're, we're trying to find, perhaps, if you want to do it graphically, an indifference curve in between these two numbers, so 800 and 1200. Maybe a 1000 could be a good idea. I don't know. Of course, we can try and see what's happening. This is easy to do in Excel, isn't it? Because here we get 80 over A1, here we get 120 over A1. Let's put in another one, which is 100 over A1, which corresponds to 1000 in the middle between here. Okay. Again, I'm doing something wrong always forget this equal sign okay so let's take this one out again no I'm actually making a new indifference curve okay I argue that it seems if I'm interested in solving this utility maximization problem I need to find an indifference curve this kind of hits the budget constraint exactly I'm just testing now to see what's happening if I use the utility level of thousand which is exactly in the middle between 800 and 1200. And I, I have this feeling that exactly in the middle it should lie, at least fairly close. So let's put that one in as well. Now there are suddenly three indifference curves. And to put them into the graph, of course, I have to add the fourth one as well. It doesn't matter the sequence here. Okay, I can put it after. That doesn't make any difference. The point is that you need to keep the first column the first one. Then you will always get the right graph. At least, I hope so. 
Let me see what's happening now. Yeah, this seems good, doesn't it? You see the, the purple one here seems to hit almost perfectly this green one. So a graphical solution here would kind of mean that we just do this exercise, just experimenting, trying to find the one which hits here. And it seemed that we, at least to a certain extent, were able to, to hit it with a utility level of 800, no, sorry, 1,000. And then, of course, we need to pick this point, draw a line down there, this point, draw a line in that direction to find the actual solution, which is the amount of F and the amount of D, which this consumer would choose to do, so to speak. Okay, did you follow this exercise? Uh, you see that Excel is a very useful tool, okay? It makes things easy. If you want to do this by hand, it takes a lot of time, actually. You see, I just did it in five, six, seven minutes. So it's, it's really something you should spend a little time on, on, on being able to use, because it's, it's handy, not only in this course, but actually in most courses. So uh, always good to learn a little bit Excel. Okay, do you want this file? Should I store it? Put it up on, what should we call it then? Exercise 1 slash 15 or something. This is exercise set 1, exercise 15. Exercise set 1, exercise 15. And this is then a, ah, I don't need to do that. This is enough. I save this on the desktop like that. Then it should show up here, hopefully. There it is, isn't it? Yes. And then we can just put it up on front here under added material. Okay. Upload file. Browse. Uh, it's this one. Okay, save. So now you can download it yourself if you want. It's a part of, of the course material. Okay. Then question C. Can Jane afford any of the bundles that give her a utility of 800? What about the utility of 1200? If we start with 1200, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? If we return to the figure, that the red one here is the utility of 1200. And the con budget constraint is here. So Jane has to be either on this straight line or under it. So she cannot reach the red line at all. So the 1200 utility is unreachable for Jane. Okay, that's the answer to the first half of, of exercise C here. So a utility level of 1200 is unreachable for Jane. What about 800? You see 800 is sometimes over, sometimes under. So certain bundles of this 800 utility is achievable. Okay, so she can actually achieve all these combinations as well as all combinations on top of this one marked under the green line. Okay, so all these bundles are available, this bundle is not available, and these bundles are not av available. So certain parts of this utility level of 800 is achievable. That is the answer to question C. Okay, then in question D, it has a star. I don't know what that means. Maybe it's particu particularly difficult then. Find Jane's utility maximizing choice or days spent traveling domestically and days spent in foreign country, which means we are trying to find two values now. Uh, what we're actually trying to find is, of course, we could have done it by just reading the D solution down here. It seems to be around 20, doesn't it? And the F solution seems to be around five. So at least we have some feeling for what the 
solution should be. But of course, what I intend to do now is to show you this mathematically. And we have already looked at how to do this. So let's do it once more on this example. Now if you're asked on the exam, do this kind of exercise, then normally I would state what the way I like it, okay? So I could say, okay, I want you to do this mathematically, or I want you to do this graphically, or I want you to do it both, okay? If nothing is stated about that, then it's your choice. Then your aim is to reach a reasonably correct solution, and then you can choose whether to do it graphically, whether to do it mathematically, or if you're very clever, you find another way of doing it. Which of course is no, no point here, <laughs> as long as you learn ways of doing it. If you want to show off, you can try that. But uh, uh, you understand what I say now, okay? So in some cases, I leave it to you to make the decision. In other cases, I make the decision for you, okay? But this, this will be clear from the exam text, hopefully. Okay? Yeah. So, how do we solve this problem? Okay, we have the utility function, which is 10 df, and we had the budget constraint on the form f equal, what was it equal to? I took it out, do you remember it? What was the cost? Was it 10? 10 minus 0 0.5. 25d was that the shape is this correct okay then we have what we need okay because the idea here is to avoid a two variable optimization problem to solve that we really need to do use some other methods which i don't at least not at this level want to introduce so we can use the virtual constraint to solve for f and input the consequence into f in the utility function. In that case, we transform the two variable problem into a single variable problem. And then we should know that we can just take the derivative of that function, equate it to zero, and solve. That would produce one of the variables, optimal choice. To find the other, we just enter the optimal choice we found in the optimization into the budget constraint to produce the other. Doesn't matter which one we find here. So we substitute. expression star into the utility function in this case then we get u which is no I which is no longer a function of two variables but which is a function of a single variable in this case d and it's 10 times d times d old f, where we now put this one in instead, 10 minus 0 0.25d. And then of course we have to, well we don't have to, but it may be convenient to multiply in here. So we get 10 times 10, which is 100, times d, and then we take 10 times 0 0.25, it's the same, uh, that's, what is that? 2.5, isn't it? Do you agree? Yeah, it must be. You just ruled it out. Okay. Minus 2.5, 10 times that one, and d times d is d squared. Okay, so this is the final equation we need. Then we can compute the derivative of this function, which is 100 times d. The derivative of this one is 100, isn't it? Always keep in mind this, func this formula. The derivative is n times d times f to the power of n minus 1. And if d has the power of 1, we subtract 1 from 1. If d to the power of 0 is by, by definition is 1, so then we end basically with something like this, 100 times 1, okay? And then there is 2 times this one, 2 times 2.5 times d to the power of 2 minus 1. 
again using the formula and then we end up with 100 minus 2 times 2 and a half which is 5 isn't it 5 d that is the derivative in this case then finally we have to set the derivative equal to 0 so u prime of d equal to 0 produces 100 minus 5d equal to 0 and then of course we can solve for d can't we by moving this part to the right hand side changing the sign divided by dividing by 5 finally so we get d equal to 100 divided by 5 and 100 divided by 5 is 20 isn't it yeah so it seemed like our initial guess was kind of good okay remember that that was our guess wasn't it the midpoint here seems to lie around 20 and it did often we put a star on this one to say that now we have kind of finished the calculation and this is the result we're looking for in this case it's an optimal value so the optimal amount of money spent on domestic vacation is 20 but it's not 20 is it because we made some changes here didn't we it was starting with four thousand dollars we, we can just continue okay so we will see the consequence of this now we can use this value for d star and enter it into the budget constraint to find f star can't we so f star would be 10 minus 0 0.25 times 20. That's 5, isn't it? 0 0.25 times 10 is 2.5 times 2 is 5, so it's 10 minus 5, so it's 5 then. So D star is 20 and F star is 5, it seems, according to my calculations. And that seems to fit good with what we guessed initially. Now remember, you could you can't add up these two numbers to get the four thousand dollars okay you you understand that this is the number of days spent on domestic vacation this is the number of days spent on foreign vacation of course you have to multiply with the the given prices here over 100 and 400 if you do that of course you end up by spending the whole amount of four thousand dollars on your combined vacation activities so if you enter again both these two into the budget constraint by taking yeah, then you will end up with the four thousand dollars if you take a hundred times f star plus four hundred sorry it was the other way around wasn't it d star f star the foreign vacation would then it, it should produce four thousand dollars because our solution is on the budget constraint and it should always be on the budget constraint given our assumptions okay that was all on this exercise do you have any questions about this yes you don't want to, you don't get the computer so then you need to draw it on the paper yes Let me just move to question C so we can see it here. Okay, it's this one. Uh, yeah, what was your question? Oh, my question is that uh, uh, we can find out the, the exact return of question C. Or is that the answer? <coughs> yeah, yeah, there, there is no question in C whether the uti utility maximization, that comes in question D. So in question C, you should answer the exact question here. Yes. Nothing more. I was kind of when I did what I did now, I kind of I, I moved C and D together in a sense, okay? Uh, 
the way I did it now, but given the structure here, uh, the answer to question C is just the following. Then we don't have this one, okay? This one is out. We have the red one and the blue one and the green one. And the, que the answer is that for the red one, no points are obtainable for Jane. For the blue one, certain points are obtainable for Jane between these and these. So this interval here will produce attainable points. And outside that interval, she cannot get that utility. That, that may of course happen. In that case, uh, it's, it doesn't matter. If you, I won't construct an example where this is important. Okay? If I do that, then I will ask you to do it mathematically. Okay? Because then you, then you will find it. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the point of these graphs is just to make some, some general arguments. Okay? We will see that certain of these funds are obtainable, others are not. For one of those, there are none available at all. Okay? So that, that's kind of the point here. Okay. Was that the uh, answers to your questions? Was it Isabella? What was your name again? Isabella. Isabella, yeah. Other questions? Everything else is clear? Okay. Then it's convenient with the break. Okay, so we meet again at 10 past.